Well, welcome to part two of our series called Like a Boss. Uh, Basically, what we're doing through this entire series is we are looking at biblical heroes that literally lived their life like a boss. And what we're doing is we're asking them, hey, how can we live our life like a boss for God too? Let's take a moment and pray. God, we love you. We worship you. We give you all the glory, we give you all the honor, and we give you all the praise today. God, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us a heart to receive. May our heart be open to receive what you want to do in and through our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Well, last week we got some really cool advice from Noah. And uh, he really helped us out when it came to, or when it comes to living our life like a boss. And this week, what we're going to do is we're going to get some really life-changing advice from the man in the Bible named Abraham. And here's the big nugget that Abraham would say. He would say this, if you want to live your life like a boss for God, you have to trust that God always does the right thing. Always. God always does the right thing. Say that with me. Say, God always does the right thing. The reason that I have to teach this is because if you're anything like me, we all have thoughts at times that God is not doing the right thing. Maybe you've prayed for something and it's not happening. Maybe you've lost a loved one sooner than you think you should have. Maybe God spoke to you and He's asking you to do something that literally seems impossible. Maybe God didn't show up at a time when you thought that He should. Maybe your life, maybe your family, Maybe your career is not turning out the way that you thought it would. And you're kind of like, okay, God, what are you doing here? Or maybe you're asking, God, why did you allow this to happen? See, some things happen in our life that we just don't understand. And and Abraham would tell us that. There's going to be things in your life that you're not going to to understand and this is where Abraham would say if you want to live your life like a boss you're going to have to learn to trust God trust God trust God even when things don't make sense why would Abraham say this let's take a look at his life and we'll see why Abraham would say this One day, true story, one day when Abraham was old and gray, and might I say, he was old and gray and childless, God told him, hey Abraham, you're going to have a son, and your son is going to be an heir. And after God says this, years go by, years, again, he's old and gray, years go by, and guess what? No child, which means Abraham doesn't have an heir. God, at this moment, does not seem to be doing the right thing. So what happens? Abraham and his wife Sarah decide that, hey, I think we need to help God out here and really kind of make things happen on our own because apparently he doesn't seem to be doing what he said he was going to be doing. Uh, He doesn't seem to be doing the right thing. So what happens? If you know the story, uh, fast forward a little bit, we see that Abraham ends up laying with Sarah's servant, and Sarah's servant gets pregnant and gives birth to a child, a son named Ishmael. However, God looks at the situation and God said, hey, I need to give you a heads up. Ishmael is not my promised child for you. But Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child of your own even though you're beyond childbearing years. Because God had promised 
to Abraham and Sarah, though something seemed impossible, that he was going to do the right thing and that he was going to give them a promised son and an heir. And his name would be Isaac. So when you look at the Bible, you're going to see that there's an Ishmael and then there is an Isaac. Let me ask you this question. What if you're in your 90s, you right there watching this, what if you're in your 90s, you're 90 years old, and God says, hey, I'm just giving you a heads up, you're going to have a child eventually. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, God, are you living in California or Colorado right now because you're not making a lot of sense? Like maybe you don't know God, but biologically, uh, that's not going to happen because as you know, things aren't happening if you know what I mean. And this is where Abraham would say, hey, I've lived this one out. I've lived this one out. I had my doubts at times too. But I need you to know this. God always does the right thing. And here's what Abraham would say. God always does the right thing, number one, even if it takes a long time. Even if it takes a long time. Abraham would say, I was expecting God to give me a child in really my childbearing years when I had reproductive ability. I had no idea that he was going to wait until I was a hundred years old to give me a child. Abraham would say, hey, I know you may not understand, but trust me, there will be times in your life where you're going to think God waited too long. And then he would go on to say this, if you want to live your life like a boss for God, it's imperative that you learn God's timing is not our timing. We see this all throughout scripture, that God's timing, your timing, the when you want things is not necessarily God's timing. And see, what we do, if you're anything like me, we have a tendency to want things now. I want this house now. I want this car now. I want to live in this certain place now. I want to get married now. I want children now. I want this promotion at work now. We want it our way, and we want it right away. And what happens? What happens when we live in a now, 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 now mentality? Here's what happens. And we see this all in America. We see that it causes us to get in crushing debt. Did you know that 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck? And a lot of that is because we have a tendency to want things now. I want it now. I deserve it. I work hard. And we're not patient. And we don't wait. And we don't save up and then make those purchases. And then it causes crushing debt. It causes us to make bad decisions. And, and it causes us to regret things. And, and those regrets really end up sticking around like Ishmael's for the rest of our life. See, so you know what happens? Do you know what happens when you take matters into your own hands? What happens is this. We create Ishmael's. And later, when God's promises do come, don't miss this, when God's promises eventually come, because they will come if we're patient, the Ishmael's that we created are still hanging around. They don't go away. And guess what you have to do? You have to keep feeding them. You have to keep caring for them. And they end up becoming a burden for the very promise that God has given you in your life. If you want to live your life like a boss, then you're going to have to let God be in charge of the promises that He has for you. Let God be in charge of your promotion, your demotion, and your no motion. See, when you do things God's way in the workplace over a long period of time, God will let promotion find you. I can remember going off to Bible school, and I remember I felt like God was calling me to be a pastor one day. I had no idea how, how I had no idea where. All I decided that I was going to do is that I was going to serve God's church. 
wherever God needed me, I was going to be there and I was going to be there faithfully and do whatever he wanted me to do. I did that for two years, just serving, serving, raising my hand. Hey, you need something? I'll help you out. What can I do for the church? And I can remember one time I was asked to, to help out with a student summer camp back in 2004. And I remember I was just serving, uh, helping out with the camp, working my tail off, sweating in the heat, telling kids, get over here, do this, that, that, let's go, come on. And I can remember a friend of mine coming up to me and saying, hey, um, the pastors want to talk to you. And I remember thinking, okay, you know, what's this all about? And I remember sitting down with the pastors, and they say, hey, we've seen you serving faithfully. We love your heart towards God's church and, and, and what you're doing here. Uh, we want you to go be a youth pastor. And in that moment, I didn't ask for it, but prom promotion found me. And it's been that way all through my walk with God. And if we put our faith in Him, guess what? Through time, and at God's perfect time, promotion will find you. See, when you do things God's way and you get demoted, let's talk about that for a second. What happens when I'm living for God and I get demoted? Check this out. You might find out when you get demoted that it was God's protection. God allowed you maybe to get demoted to another branch because he knew in the near future your current branch was going to get closed down. See, when you do things God's way and God allows no motion, what about that? I've been faithful, I've been faithful, I've been faithful. Nothing seems to be happening. It could be because God is setting you up for the perfect Isaac, not the Ishmael, Isaac promotion in your life. You just have to wait and be patient. Say that with me. Say, I'm going to wait and I'm going to be patient for the promises of God. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write this down. If you want to be a great person of faith, you're going to have to learn to be comfortable in the wait. If you want to be a great person of faith, God, do something incredible with my life. Then you're going to have to learn to get very comfortable in waiting. Waiting for God's promises to come to fruition. See, here's the deal. God's not in a rush. God is never late. God is never early. God is always right on time. Because God always does the right thing. Habakkuk 2.3, it says this, for the vision, the vision for your life, the vision for what God has for, for you is yet for the what? Appointed. Say that. Appointed. It's for the appointed time. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. God says, hey, it will certainly come. The promises I have for you, they're certainly going to come, and they're going to be good for your life. It will not delay. What does this mean? God has an appointed time for everything in your life, even if you have to wait a long time for it. Here's the second thing Abraham would say, and that is this. God always does the right thing. Number two, even if we don't understand. Ever been there before? You don't understand what God's doing. All you know is, man, I just got to trust the Lord right now because God always does the right thing. See, when Sarah was in her 90s, and Abraham was a hundred years old, guess what happened? God gave them their promised son, and they named him Isaac. But what Abraham didn't know is that was not the biggest test of his life. The biggest test of his life would actually come later. And what happens is one day out of the clear blue, God says, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, the promised son that I've given you, your heir, and I want you to take him to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him, sacrifice him as an offering to me. God never intended him to do that, but what God was doing is God was testing Abraham's faith. Will you do what I've asked you to do? Will you be faithful to me? Will you obey me in every area of your life. Did you know that God will allow you to go through things that you don't understand as a test of your faith? God is going to test your faith. And vibrant church, let us be a people that serves God and says, 
I am going to pass this test. There's been things that I've walked through in life where I'm going, obviously, this is a test from God. And I have solidified it in my soul. I am going to pass this test no matter what. That is the type of people that God wants you and me to be. We're going to obey and listen to God in every area of our life. And the things that God tests us in is this. Check this out. And the, thing, the things about God's tests is, if you don't pass the test, that test is going to come around again. It's just going to have different names and different faces. Ever been there? It's like you, you experience this test here, you know you didn't pass it, and that same test comes maybe years down the road, or moments down the road, or months down the road. But it's that same one. It just has different names and different faces. So what does Abraham do? What does Abraham do? Abraham, he begins to get ready to sacrifice Isaac. That's what he does. Abraham never questions God about this current situation. Now, if you look through the Bible, you'll see that he questioned God about different situations, but he never questioned God about going and sacrificing Isaac. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't Abraham question God? Because at every season of his life, Abraham knew that God showed himself faithful. When Abraham was questioning him here, God showed himself faithful. He questioned here. God showed himself faithful. He questioned here. God showed himself faithful. And Abraham said, this is not going to be any different. And maybe you've seen that in your own life. I want you to reflect on how faithful God has been in your life, despite pain, despite troubles, despite challenges, even through those. In this world, we are promised we are going to have troubles, is what Jesus tells us. But despite those troubles, God will be faithful. Think about it for a second. Think about how God has been faithful in your life. See, at every season, God showed himself faithful to Abraham. And here's what the Bible says, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It says, by faith, by faith, Abraham, when God did what? When God tested him, he offered Isaac as a, so a sacrifice. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned, don't miss this, Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Abraham thought, no worries, God, you're asking me to sacrifice Isaac, I'm in. I'll do whatever you want me to do because I know this, that you've promised Isaac to be my heir. So this cannot end in Isaac dying. In fact, if I go to do this and I sacrifice Isaac, I trust and know and believe that you can raise him from the dead, God. I trust you in that. In other words, Abraham would say, the more you know God, the more you'll trust God. Do you know God? Through the different seasons of your life, have you rested in God? Have you rested in God's peace? Have you rested in God's trust? Or have you tried to take things into your own hands? And you've maybe created some Ishmaels in your life instead of waiting for the Isaacs. Here's what the Bible says. It says in Psalms 9.10, it says, Those who know the Lord, trust Him. Those who know the Lord, I trust you, Father. I worship you. No matter what comes my way, my faith is in you. No matter what you ask me to do, God, I will obey and I will do it even when I don't understand. Even when it seems like you're taking too long. Because God, you always do the right thing. You always do the right thing. As I was writing this message, I was thinking about prayers over the years that I've prayed. And I look back and I go, I am so thankful that God did not answer those prayers. You ever been there? Any of those prayers that you've prayed and you're like, "Woo! thank God you did not answer those prayers. What does this show us? It shows us that God knows best. God knows best. 
And if we want to live our life like a boss for God, then we need to give up the obsession of having to know everything. If I know, then I'll move in faith. Well, that's not faith. If I know how you're going to do it, God, then I'm going to step out and I'll do it. No, 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 no. We always step into the water before God parts the water. That's what God has asked us to do. We need to give up the obsession of having to know everything and turn that pursuit, turn that obsession, and instead of knowing everything, God, I just need to know you. I just want to know you because when I know who you are, I know that everything else will be okay. When my heart rests in you, then I know everything else is going to be all right. God, are we good? Because if you and I are good, then I'm good. That's all I need to know. Are we good? Because if, if you and me, if we're good, then I'm good. I just want to know you. God, I don't have to know everything. I just want to know you. As we land the plane with Abraham today, I think one of the last things that he would tell us, it really has to do with our perspective. And that is this. Abraham would say, hey, Vibrant Church, Christians all around the world, don't make this earth your home. Don't make this world your home. Abraham would say that if you keep your eyes on this world and the dream that life will become one day something, everything that you hoped for, if that's your hope, one day you're going to be extremely disappointed. Earth is going to disappoint you. This world is broken. You will experience pain. You will experience challenges. You will experience troubles. Don't get rooted here is what Abraham would say. Don't get to a place where your satisfaction comes through the events and the pleasures of this world. Abraham would say it this way. He would say, hey, you're just passing through. You're just passing through this place. You're going to be here 70, 80, 90, potentially 100 years. You're just passing through because one day you will spend eternity somewhere. And he would say, as you're passing through, make it your goal to take as many people to heaven with you as you can. My question for you today, church, is this. When is the last time that you led somebody to the Lord? When's the last time that you actually shared your faith with someone? That is what you and me are called to do as followers of Christ. It's not just about attending. It's not just about watching. Those things are good. But at some point, we have to become a player in the game. We have to get in. We have to come out of the stadium, get onto the field, and start playing. And we have to start telling people and sharing what God has done in our life with other people. And it may look different. Who knows what it looks like for your life? It, it may be at the workplace. It, who knows? It may be with your friends or your family members. But God has called you to take as many people to heaven with you as you can. And I just want you to think about it. Who can I share my faith with? God, give me opportunities to be bold for you. Give me opportunities at the grocery store, out in the community. Give me opportunities to share your message of Jesus Christ and the hope that he has given me. Here's what Abraham would say. He would show us Philippians 3.20 where it says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. This is where ultimately our citizenship is. It's in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what we have to understand. You and me, we all have an expiration date. We all have a day when we're going to take our last breath and we do not know when that is going to be. We all have a day when this earth will no longer be our home. And our new home will be in a place that is forever called heaven or hell. It's the truth. There's only two options for eternity. Heaven or a real place called hell. For those whose faith is in Jesus Christ, their forever home will be heaven. But for those who do not surrender their life to Christ, to Jesus, and live according to His ways, their life, their eternity, their forever life, forever home, 
will be in a place called hell. Ultimately, what Abraham would say is, where will your forever home be? Where are you going to spend eternity? God always does the right thing. And the right thing that God did 2,000 years ago was send His Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to live a sinless life, to die the most agonizing death a human being could die by hanging on a cross and suffocating, then being buried in a tomb and being raised from the dead by the power of God to defeat sin, defeat death, and defeat the grave. When we put our hope in Him, He defeats the sin in our life. He defeats death, and He defeats grave, the grave. And He gives us the path and the way to spend eternity in heaven with Him. Where's your hope today? Is it in Jesus Christ? Or is it in the things and the possessions and the material things of this world?